All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Everybody doing awesome today? Yeah. Perfect. This is great because I'm gonna help you create something awesome today, just like the intro to every single one of my YouTube videos. For those of you who are familiar with that joke. So my name is Roberto Blake. Uh, I have a digital agency, Create Awesome Media, which is the company that basically is the machine that I run my own personal brand through. I'm a YouTube uh, instructor that is a creative entrepreneur. Basically, I found a way to not be a starving artist and I can do everything that I love every single day and not live in a cardboard box doing it, which is pretty fun. And I think a lot of people here, anybody here interested in doing that? Yeah. That's what I thought. So today we're gonna to be talking about YouTube titles and thumbnails. And the fun thing for me is that my background is that I come from the world of graphic design and web design. So when I got into YouTube, I kind of had a little bit of what I call an unfair advantage because I used to make billboards for a living. Um, in the height of my career, I worked at an uh, agency in New York doing like HBO boxing billboards, um, things like that. And what I realized about YouTube is that it has to pass the same test when it comes to thumbnails that a really good out of home advertisement like a billboard or like a movie poster does because it has to create context and it has to make you curious enough to actually follow through on this thing. You gotta buy a movie ticket, you're gonna tune on to uh, Game of Thrones. There has to be something about the presentation that makes you take that action. In the case of YouTube, that's called a click. I don't know if anybody here has talked about this as an instructor yet, but overwhelmingly, if you can get more people to just click on your videos and get that click-through rate up, it's gonna be the thing that overwhelmingly, disproportionately makes you successful in YouTube because everything you want, a view, a subscriber, is on the other end of a click on your video. And the enticement to that click is the title and the thumbnail, because that's what we have to go off of, right? So you gotta have search-friendly titles or titles that can get you recommended unless your name happens to be, uh, unless your last name happens to be Paul, in which case you can do whatever you want and you'll win, right? We all know that that's a reality now. So uh, let's go ahead and get into it. I've done over a thousand online videos on YouTube alone and then hundreds in the other online platforms and live streaming. Uh, my YouTube channel is uh, currently just at about a quarter of a million subscribers. And I did that with searchable video titles and really good thumbnails. Owing to my background in graphic design and photography, and then on the searchable titles part, owing to my background in web design and SEO, which means that I already figured out some of the Google algorithm stuff and how to rank back in the world of blogging. Has anybody here been a blogger before and written online posts and articles, things like that? Then you guys know how important it used to be to really try to do everything you could to rank in a Google search. The parent company of YouTube is Google. So you can see how you can apply some of the lessons from that and from what you've done and what you've read about online SEO in the context of Google over to YouTube and its algorithm. We'll get into that in a minute. But ultimately, I managed to build a following of a quarter million subscribers and my uh, most successful videos to date have between 900,000 and 500,000 views and I did it without having a single viral video. None of those videos immediately were wildly successful. They got 1,000 views their first day or 3,000 in the first 48 hours. My most successful video to this date. You would have thought it was a flop because a year ago, May 2016, first 48 hours it only got 3,300 views. But as of well, today it has over 900,000 views and almost all of that is owed to optimizing the video to be searched and clicked on that, changing the thumbnail which really blew it up after its first three months, which tells you that, hey, a video that you think is dead and is underperforming, as long as the content is something that's still valuable today, you can bring a video back from the dead because for the first six months or so of that video, the most it had gotten was about 40, 50,000 views. Got the overwhelming majority of those 900,000 six months after it had already been out. And I owed that to re-optimizing it using a tool called TubeBuddy. If you guys are not familiar with, is anyone here familiar with TubeBuddy? All right, they're not sponsoring this talk. They really should be. Like, Phil, I hope you're listening. You should be sponsoring this talk. Anyway, um, no, uh, the reason is they're a YouTube appliance that you can get and they're YouTube certified, so they're all within terms of service. The reason I bring it up is because for those of you who aren't using it, this is the tool that using to optimize this one video, my most successful video to date, six months after the fact, feeling it was underperforming for what it was compared to other videos, changing the thumbnail and updating all of my tags to rank overwhelmingly made the difference in that video's success and took it from having between 40 and 60,000 views after its first six months 
to having 900,000 views today without going viral and without being picked up by BuzzFeed. So even if you can't have viral success in YouTube, you can still win on just having search friendly titles and emotionally enticing thumbnails that work for you. And that's all I did for the last like three, four years to build my following in YouTube. Now there are three types of content in YouTube and this is gonna be important because it's gonna help you figure out your titles and your thumbnails. There is help and tutorial content, which is what my specialty is. There is hub and community content that's based on uh, doing exactly what your fan base loves and doing that and finding a way to do it over and over. One of the best examples of that is probably Jake and Logan Paul. And then there's hero content, highly polished, highly produced content. And literally that is the entire channel of Casey Neistat. That is basically making a film every day, as he would say. Um, so what drives clicks? You have to make your thumbnails competitive with the ranking videos in your niche. If you make a video and you decide that, okay, this is a great video, I figured out the title, it's something people are searching for, but then the thumbnail is just a still frame out of your video and it's not really that good or that interesting or emotionally satisfying, how is it going to compete with videos that have uh, more views than yours? How is it going to compete with videos that have um, a massive fan base behind them and have a lot of shares. How is this going to be competitive if it's not at least competitive visually? It has to at least be competitive visually in order for you to have that advantage of a click because if it's at least new, then you can stand out. Now there's a hack in here that I haven't told you yet and here's one of those hacks. Visually on the YouTube search page, has anyone ever noticed that there's a little call out whenever a video is new? Have you guys ever seen that before, show of hands? How many of you have seen that same type of call out for a video that is done in 4K video? You guys have seen that? It puts a little 4K symbol right there under the description of the video. Anybody notice that? They also do it if a video is closed caption. Have you guys seen that? Show of hands. And they also do it if it's in 360 or VR. So guess what? If your video has a little something extra, and maybe you can't do it in 4K, but if you're at least closed captioning your videos, and you can do that pretty cheap with like rev.com, also hashtag not sponsored, um, then that's another tool you can use and it's $1 for every minute of closed captioning. I don't not only do that because it's a good thing to do and it helps me with reach in the search engine, but immediately if I have a video that's new and it's shot in 4K and it has closed captioning, it has these three little things that visually differentiate it from every other thing in a search result. Or if I even have one of those things in my favor, it differentiates me from everything else that stands there on the search page. So my video stands out. And if something stands out, there's a better chance that people click on it. Other hacks obviously include making your title trigger curiosity. I've noticed that titles with a question mark or with you know, dot, dot, dot after it, or where one word is called out in capital letters, makes us curious about what is that thing. And if you've ever looked at articles and posts on social media that grab your attention, you can see the clear evidence of things like this and that, you know what, that worked on me. I bet you it works on other people. So you could literally walk backwards from how am I behaving? What is it that I'm clicking on? What's getting me curious or excited whenever I see things? If you start actually analyzing and recording your own behavior day to day for maybe a week or a month and keeping some notes on it, if you are the same demographic and niche as your audience, Guess what? You figured out what will work with, for someone with your user psychology, and you know what the YouTube algorithm is trying to do? It's trying to mimic that. You literally, every single person in here, every single one of you, the YouTube algorithm is just trying to predict what you will do and what you like and what you'll click on. If you really want to figure out and break the YouTube algorithm, all you have to do is watch your own user behavior because I'm here to tell you, that's exactly what YouTube and Google are doing. They're just watching your user behavior and then trying to anticipate what to give you based on what you did last. What'd you search for? What'd you watch last? That's it. Big secret, right? That's the YouTube algorithm, artificial intelligence. Oh, I'm just trying to mimic what a human being will do. If you're your key demographic, map your own user behavior. What thumbnails have you clicked on and what they have in common? Start doing screenshots and figuring that out. Figure out what's emotionally satisfying to you that's making you click on these thumbnails and if that would work for your audience or someone shares an audience with you, you don't copy them, but you learn from them. You study them. What factors were here? What was the strategy? What was the thought process behind this? So you want to do that. 
but you don't wanna be a me too. You don't wanna be a clone. You wanna be unique. You wanna stand out, which is my other presentation. Also, it is the lead song in a Goofy movie for those of you who are old enough to remember that. You guys appreciate that? Stand out and notice me. What everybody wants on YouTube, right? You got a little karaoke here for free. I'll take tips at the end of the session. Um, so, no. Um, for help content, you definitely also want to make your titles clear and concise, but guess what? That doesn't mean make a short title. Anyone here ever said, oh, make your titles short in YouTube? Anybody ever hear that advice? There is a study by Matt Gillen from Little Monster Media, formerly of Frederator Networks, and he found out that there's no empirical evidence that a shorter title works. Now, if something is short and sweet and that's emotionally satisfying, you could get that if that's what works in your demographic, but here's the thing. If you're teaching something that's interesting or complex, a long title that tells you exactly what it is means that you don't feel like you're being tricked. You don't feel like this is clickbait. You don't feel like you're being duped. And on the other hand, if you are challenging something and you think that something is false, you might click on it just so that you can yell in the comments about the fact that it's false. So that's another psychological hack. So you have to just make a decision. What I'm here to tell you is that there are no real secrets, there are no magic answers. It's all figuring out the user behavior of your audience. And if you're the type of person that makes up your audience, you just have to be self-aware and figure yourself out. And maybe that just comes down to a little bit of analysis. Now for hero and hub content, you gotta make your titles exciting. You gotta make the thumbnail really visually interesting. One of the things that I've found has worked really well if you're an on-camera personality or presence is expressive faces, or what I like to call big eyes, open mouth. <laughs> Everybody clicks on, right? I, I've seen it work, but there's other ways around that. Sometimes if you have something that is a title that is challenging an assertion or assumption or a commonly known thing, you can do something else like this, you know, or you can mean mug it, or you can, and Again, emotionally satisfying. You, can con you have to convey some strong emotion. Neutrality only works if it's kind of like the framing of the title says that I'm not a fan of this and you shouldn't be either. You know, Like if you were doing a movie review and you decided that this thing was meh, you could have that expression on your face and if it's less than enthusiastic, people are gonna click on that because they're gonna wanna know, was it really that bad? So just keep these psychological triggers in mind. If I was gonna give you any advice about YouTube, it would be understand the psychology of your audience. So here is an example of a YouTube search page if you type in how to make passive income online. As you can see, that's my top performing video, ranks number one. But even if it wasn't ranked number one, you'll notice some distinctions between it and the other top ranking videos on the page. Let me go ahead and just actually turn this to the audience. Front row. What is one of the things you immediately notice that's different between my thumbnail and the other thumbnails that are here in the search result? Oh, I'll take a volunteer. You have the closed captioning at the bottom. Right. It does indicate that this video has closed captioning. That immediately calls attention to it. But let's say you don't happen to be from the United States, Canada, or the UK, but you at least can read English if you don't speak it natively, you might be more enticed to click on that because, oh, somebody paid to have cl accurate closed captions done on this video versus the other videos. What are some other differences? Anybody see anything? You and then you. You have a lot more contrast in yours with like the black and white. So even though other ones that have big passive income, it doesn't stick out as much. Right. So the legibility, this is similar to what I talked about with billboards, the billboard test. When you're driving 60 miles an hour down a freeway, you don't have a lot of time. So if something has too many words or they're too small to read them, you have no idea what it's talking about. So I took that thesis to YouTube of, you know what? If I do my titles and my thumbnails in a way where they can immediately get attention, especially with the thumbnails where the text is readable, even those of you in the back of the room can probably see that text, right? That makes a huge difference. And then in your mobile devices and where YouTube, as you guys know, are, is going, is that over 55% of the traffic now is mobile on YouTube and they're prioritizing how they handle almost everything from a design standpoint with a mobile first initiative. This is where they wanna play. That makes a huge difference if something is bigger, bolder, and has more contrast, especially on a mobile device. I was gonna say that the 
say I like that passive income is um, compact and it's together and because the fourth one down is big passive income but it's spaced out and it's cozied up to the edge and I like that it's a little more center set. To me it stands out a lot more and that's where my eye went first. So you immediately noticed all of the typography and design elements, the visual spacing, the fact that it has breathing room, but at the same time that it feels like a complete thought. So you noticed all of the intention and the graphic design that like kind of went in there as far as like this looks like it was well designed and this looks like it was thought out versus this is, oh, this is a still frame out of the thing. I throw some text on here. I throw some money at it and you know, and again, I love most of the channels that are here represented and they all do great content, but there's a difference between when you see a thumbnail that says, this was like somebody's 90, 95% effort or artistic ability here or photography skill versus uh, this just seems like they need to put together a custom thumbnail. And that makes a difference. The face on the top one, I mean, not that it's yours, which of course is a handsome face. Well, thank you very much, I'll take it. <laughs> you hear that? Uh, it's not me, I didn't put him up to that. He said it of his own volition. Not sponsored. Right? Not sponsored. It's the only face that conveys an emotion that I want to associate with passive income. Which is a big smile and direct eye contact. So yes, your actual ability to do that, to have an expressive face and the right emotional association, I'm glad you brought that out, that goes back to psychology. It's like, you know what, I, my trick when I was a photographer for getting kids and parents alike to smile on camera was I was like, all right, instead of everyone says cheese, I say, all right, everyone say money. And you see what happened when I even said the word immediately. Right? You can't think and say the word money without immediately cheesing because I think that we all have a very positive association with the desire to make money. At least I would hope so if we're in this room and if we're at this conference. So, and if we're spending time and money on YouTube. <laughs> so um, yes, all of those things make a difference. And all of you, I didn't even have to put you up to it. All of you were able to see things that will say to you that I might be more likely to click on this one than on the other ones. It doesn't hurt that it's first in the results but even if it wasn't, the visual contrast between all of the other things that ranked in the result and then the, co the, the contrast of the level of design quality and photo quality all play a role in saying this video might theoretically be better than the others. Because we all know that just because something has more views that it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a better video, it just means it has more views. That could even have something to do with the timestamps. Something none of you pointed out was that there's a difference between the timing in the timestamps and then there might be the ability to say, you know what, for the sake of my time, it's easier to make an emotional commitment to this versus that just based on how much time I have available. 13 minutes, 14 minutes might feel a little better than 24 minutes, just for the sake of time. Gentleman in the back. Also, the third one down with the timestamps, um, all the text is sort of conflicting with it, making it harder to read the text itself. I'm so glad you pointed that out. Something that I've been paying attention to with YouTube is the placement of where they do things with their visuals, and I know for a fact that we, uh, many of you here have heard good design practices, is, especially in the West, is prioritizing top to bottom, left to right. Well, all the companies know that too, so when they wanna put something into their interface, they're prioritizing top to bottom, left to right. So as a designer, I had to start thinking the opposite of that. I had to start thinking that they're gonna to go top to bottom, left to right. I have to mirror that, which means that I have to avoid putting anything that's super important visually in that bottom right-hand corner because the timestamp is gonna take up that space and that real estate is even bigger for them when it comes to the mobile side. It takes up almost a quarter of the bottom of your screen there when you're on the mobile. So putting anything that's important in terms of text there, it's guaranteed to get lost. And a lot of people don't think about that when they're making their videos. They're just trying to go with the design rules without applying them in the context of how YouTube is working as a platform. The other thing is if you use YouTube end cards, the very, very top of your thumbnail, they will put text there. Some of you who share your stuff on Facebook might notice that Facebook does the same. And that when you share it in Google+, Plus, if you still happen to use that, it does the same in LinkedIn and so on and so forth. So you have to give yourself some breathing room at the top there. Maybe not on the photography side, but definitely on when you do typography and text. You and then senior. Okay, um, so one thing I noticed is 
that your channel is more personable than other people's. Like, if you look at your video, it says Roberto Blake. So it's like, oh, that's a person that I can relate to. If you look at half the other videos, it's Project Life Master. It's like, oh, that's not a person. Why do I want to deal with some weird project when I can deal with a real person? That's definitely a good point. Psychologically, it can go either way. We haven't talked about the naming conventions of a channel versus an individual video, but do keep in mind that sometimes that plays a role. And there are different times in the culture of YouTube and online media where sometimes it'll be more favorable to have uh, the idea or the identity of a brand. And maybe it fits the context of your video. If you um, say at some point, I mean, as, a, as Roberto Blake being my YouTube channel, it would be more difficult for me to start to bring on uh, people who could do a takeover for a video unless it's styled as a collab. It'd be harder for me to literally ever pull back and just have other people putting content on this platform. I'd have to build a different channel for that, which by the way, I've built a secret channel for that. Um, coming soon. But you're right, you know, it's harder to build that personal relationship sometimes and then if it's an issue of trust, then you know that could be a problem. But what I'm not gonna tell you to do is go out and rename your entire channel because guess what? The culture of YouTube is fickle. What's in today and what matters psychologically today, that could change two months from now, it could change three months from now. Something that, and it's why people who go viral sometimes have a problem with scaling that and maintaining um, the longevity there. So uh, last one for this slide. Uh, there's a subliminal in yours that's not present in the others and that is Yours is completely staged. It's not a snap, a, a still from the video, which tells a viewer, this is important enough to you that you set up this photograph, you set up all this information, you're taking the time, you're, you're, you're investing yourself in sharing this, which means it's gonna mean something more to me because I conveyed the maximum amount of effort in the design aesthetic of the thumbnail. It conveys that I'm probably putting that much effort into the quality of the information, the production of the video, everything, and that's a great point. And that's something somebody sees without knowing they see it. Exactly, and so give your audience some real credit that you know, this stuff might sound like, wow, you're talking about a lot of like really advanced high level stuff, Roberto, but there's a reason that Apple's the most profitable brand in the world and they don't even have to make the best product to do that. Sorry, shade being thrown there. Um, and again, from the guy who's wearing the Apple watch, right? Um, but just saying, they got me. <laughs> it works. All the subtle psychology, all of the things that they apply, all of the research that they spent billions of dollars over the past couple of decades into pays off dividends for them. And by the way, you can watch what's successful with a brand that's already done the work and you can walk backwards and reverse engineer. I broke out the psychology of my thumbnails for you guys because I want you to reverse engineer that. This is one of my more recent thumbnails and you can see the level of effort that went into that. But look at the psychology of it. I just told you about how YouTube takes up some of the top there for the end cards. So you can see I planned for that. I told you how they take up the bottom right hand corner. I clearly planned for that. Why well, I want people to understand the association between this video and its Instagram and that it's Adobe Premiere Pro. I used the um, logos from that very effectively. I used them in order of priority. And you'll notice that I even went and used visual devices in the form of arrows to lead your eye direction and make you prioritize things. You may not have been able to ever articulate that that's what I did, but it's something that would make you feel like, oh wow, this is a good thumbnail. It gives context because I have a unique character. I had a different way of you know, presenting those logos. It's not just slapping them on there. There's intent. And then I'm showing you the interface so you can understand that this is a tutorial so that you realize, oh, you know what? This isn't necessarily just gonna be a talking head video. This is gonna be interface. This is gonna be UI. And so that's a difference. If I'm gonna be on camera, I like to usually put my face in the video. If I'm not gonna be on camera, or if it's not the priority of me being on camera, like let's say it's a product review, I try to make that the hero of the thumbnail. So intentional thumbnails. If you're gonna be on camera and you're demonstrating a product, let's say you're doing, or you're making a recipe. My friend Kayla Gallagher, Panko Bunny, she has a great YouTube channel. She's one of the smartest people on thumbnails because her YouTube channel is growing. She has about 45K subscribers, but she has 150,000 in Instagram and 120,000 in Facebook. And a lot of it is owed to the aesthetic quality of how she frames her shots for these recipes and cooking things and the beautiful photography that she does. She does staged photography for all the thumbnails of her recipes. And it's brilliant because she's not just relying on taking a still frame out of the video, it's not an afterthought. So if you want people to prioritize clicking on your content, 
the thing that they're clicking on can't be an afterthought. I'm not saying you can't use a still frame from your video. I've done that, but there's an effective way to do that. You can do that and then maybe you slap a border around it because with all the white material design on YouTube, that border might stand out from everybody else who has a video and they're just, oh, it's an end to end into infinity thing. As far as a photograph, the border makes it distinct and the aesthetic of your video standing out. I have a custom character that I had, I paid Joshua Pomeroy of Pomeroy Creative to do a lot of different poses of mini Roberto here so that I could make um, my brand even more unique, make it stand out from anyone else doing a tutorial. And so now I have a brand aesthetic where if I'm doing a tutorial, you've got mini Roberto sitting there lifting something up like he's Link from Legend of Zelda lifting up a new item or a Triforce. I literally lifted that from Nintendo. So uh, conceptually, but you know, it's different enough, so I'm good. Yo, because where's the fair use? <laughs> so um, just think about the intention and the anatomy of your thumbnails. Think about what are you doing in terms of background, foreground, middle ground, not only in photography, but in design. You guys know about those rules of photography because you're YouTubers, you know about it on camera. You can also apply that to your thumbnails. If you're just gonna use photography and you're gonna use an expressive face, then try and use the depth of field technique. Try and go ahead and use a, a prime lens, like a 50 millimeter or a 35 millimeter, shoot at f1.8 or f2.8, um, something like that to blur out that background and to make yourself the hero of the shot in frame. Really think about that. If you're gonna go ahead and just update it in Canva, maybe not all of you are Photoshop wizards, but with my tutorial videos, since I did a whole bunch of those, especially when I got started, maybe you can be a Photoshop wizard, just saying. Um, whole playlist of those videos. But again, with that in mind, you could go into Canva and just take really good photography and add very simple text that's called out that has a rectangle behind it with a certain level of opacity behind it and then that's enough with a border to make that text stand out and be visible against a really good photograph. And then if you just position it, knowing how much real estate YouTube takes up up here and then down in the right, you can go ahead and you can make an effective thumbnail that way and you can stage it with just a good shot. Even if that's a still frame from your video or even if you do a photo shoot before or after the video to set up for this, what I would recommend is just make sure you're being intentional and that you've thought about what would I click on out of all the results that can show up on that page? So let's talk a little bit about the titles because we went heavy on thumbnails. Let's talk about research. Make data-driven decisions. If, is there anyone here who hasn't started uploading to YouTube yet at all? A few of you. Okay, so for those of you just getting started, tubebuddy.com slash awesome. That is my link for TubeBuddy. It is a little bit of an affiliate link, but it gets you 20% off of TubeBuddy if you use the code Roberto's Buddy. Here's why I'm going to call out that tool. There's a free version, by the way, but the paid version is infinitely better. And here's why. You can go ahead and you can search for things that you would type into YouTube to try to find your video. And it will tell you how that search will perform. It can tell you whether there's high competition for that or low competition. It can tell you whether there's high search volume, low search volume, average search volume. Don't just avoid something if it has low search volume though, if it has low competition, because it's an opportunity to dominate. And this is what I mean about data-driven decisions. If you are making the video that very few people have made and you can rank number one for that, what's low search volume for YouTube? The platform has over a billion users actively every month watching videos. What's low to them might be the beginnings of you getting your first 1,000 views, 10,000 views, your first 100 subscribers, your first 1,000 subscribers. So don't look at something that says, oh, it's low competition, but nobody's quote unquote searching for it. Who's nobody? If you have zero subscribers, who's nobody? You need every subscriber you can get when you're starting out. So if you start with search-friendly content, is anyone here thinking about being a vlogger? Anybody? Okay, so before you do um, a vlog, you might need to load up with something that might be searched just in case so that you can get the traction to have at least a few people paying attention to what you're doing and you have something to generate incoming views because someone doesn't know you yet enough to be interested in your story by itself. And what might make for an interesting vlog title may not get any love in search, may not get recommended against any videos. And so there's only a few ways you can do that. One of the few ways you can do that is, is anyone here familiar with the concept of YouTube tag videos? 
videos where you quote unquote call out your friends or ask other people to make similar videos. All right, so those are what are like might be considered hub or community content, but not for your community, but the YouTube community as a whole. And what those videos are things like, you know, 10 uh, facts about me tag, or the my first kiss tag, and so on and so forth. It's an opportunity for people who are just casual YouTubers to make content that other people have made with similar titles, so that you all show up and recommended and related to each other, and so that you might be able to grow together. So that's something for small YouTubers to do when you're just getting started it may not be very search friendly, but the tag by itself, because it might be in trend right now, or it might be the thing that's being done for this month, you might be able to siphon some views and some searches from that. So you can do that community content. Yes? When speaking of the two, buddy, do you prioritize the competition or the searchability? You know how that has those two factors? I, I prioritize more so the volume of searches for me than the competition, but I look at both and I don't ignore both. And I'll tell you what my thesis on that is. Because I came from the world of SEO and because I have a thousand previous videos of data and habits that have informed me, I have uh, confidence, not overconfidence, but justified confidence that if I wanna rank for something, I can probably figure it out and figure out what I need to write in a three sentence description, what I need to change my title to, what tags to make, what playlist I need to put this in, what videos I need to add to that playlist from other channels, I can kind of like growth hack my way into something that's wildly competitive. In fact, I did it with, uh, anyone familiar with the Microsoft Surface Studio? So in that, I outranked on search some of the biggest tech YouTubers of all time for my video on that. Um, almost easily and I ended up getting about a third of the views that like Detroit Borg somebody who has a million subscribers and back then I think I only had like maybe hundred and forty thousand by comparison I outranked them in the search on that but I also got a third of the views that he got and I got like the same kind of views that um, major tech publications with YouTube channels with like two million subscribers got so I'm here to tell you by the way subscriber count has nothing to do with your ability to compete in search the advantage of subscriber count is maybe you get more views in the first 48 hours because you have a subscriber base. Maybe you get more social shares. I'm not saying subscriber counts are irrelevant. I'm saying that they don't give you the advantage in the algorithm you think they do. The behavior of those subscribers do. If you have subscribers and they don't respond to a video, having them doesn't give you any advantage. So you know I know that personally as being a tutorial channel. There is no continuity between my videos for the most part. I've done a thousand individual unique videos and aside from maybe five or 10 videos that are related to each other in a playlist, there is no continuity day to day between my videos. Unlike a vlogger, a cooking channel, a gaming channel, a science channel, if you're doing something like what I'm doing, which is entrepreneurship and creative resources, if you're, for lack of a better term, a reference channel, like myself or Tim Schmoyer or Daryl Eves, a channel like that, your view to subscriber ratio is not going to be, it's going to hurt you more than anything, but it's not an indicator of your performance and it actually doesn't give you any advantage in the algorithm to have a bigger subscriber base. I guarantee you that I could make a video, I, I guarantee you I could have a million subscribers. If I had a million subscribers tomorrow, I could still make a video that would only get 10,000 views. I could still make a video that would only get 10,000 views. Part of the reason I know that is because uh, one of my mentors, Gary Vaynerchuk, has about 750,000 subscribers. Anyone here familiar with uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V? So if you go back and you look at his channel historically, even with him having a million followers on Twitter for years, there are videos in his inventory, even from the last two years, that have like less than 5,000 views on them. There are individual videos, and it's not even, we're not even talking about like his hour-long keynotes, which by the way, if you watch his hour-long keynotes, you will learn how to make money or be successful online. Like that's just a given, and you know, he's not one of the greatest public speakers currently for no reason. But it doesn't matter if the emotional commitment or the desire or need for that particular thing at that particular time isn't there for a viewer or an audience, which is why when I talk about searchable titles and long-form content and the research, how it performs today, if you're doing something searchable, doesn't have any indication of how it performs indefinitely. Remember, I made a video a year ago that only got 3,000 views, that today is inching its way to a million views over the course of a year, and it got most of that in the last six months. So what's you know, not hitting today if it's something that's evergreen and it's search friendly? 
could hit tomorrow. And one of the benefits in the algorithm, by the way, if you make search-friendly content, let's say you make a video and it doesn't perform well now, but let's say someone makes a video with almost the exact same title as you, but you're outranking them, you could start to siphon views because every time a video comes up in recommended and related, it's your video, you're right there. You guys, if you've been to Daryl Eves' sessions, he talks about this being one of the most important factors. In my channel, it used to be that search gave me over 50% of my views. Search now gives me 33% of my views, but the same things that related and recommended videos utilize is the same thing that search utilizes. Your metadata, your title, your description, and your tags. But even if you rank, and even if you're recommended, what gets you clicked is the thumbnail. Does that make sense? So you can have the best title in the world, you can rank all you want, you can use all the informed data, but then you still have to deal with the emotional factor of getting someone to click. So what's a search-friendly title? Titles that match keywords used in the first paragraph description and the search phrases created in the tags. When you're tagging, do not use single words in your tags anymore. When you're doing the keywords at the bottom of YouTube, don't use single word tags anymore. Use phrases. What would you type into the search box of YouTube if you were trying to find this video? It's not a single word, I guarantee you. Somebody, give me an example of a video that you recently made or that you're planning to make. Anybody, like let's get two or three people for this. Show of hands, someone volunteer, yes. Dirt bike fail. Dirt bike fail. Okay, so if I was going to um, go with that, that is more of an emotional title than a search-friendly title. Um, how to for something like that, much more challenging. But if I was gonna try to do it, I would probably do something like how to wreck your dirt bike, dirt bike fail compilation. And I would probably then make that video. So even like, you would put how to even if it was like a vlog in the, in the dirt bike? If, I, if my answer is that I want to do search, because here's the thing, if you're going to do vlogs, and the video itself is a vlog versus you doing some search content balanced in your strategy to help your vlogs, then that's different. If you're gonna do a vlog, you almost on some level, at least for the title, you abandon search. If you're gonna do a vlog in some cases, if it's not something that's about what you're thinking or if it's not something that would generically be typed in, you're almost abandoning search in favor of, can I get shares on this? because it's a different strategy. If I wanted um, a dirt bike fail video to do better, and I'm just starting out, I might have made how-to videos about dirt bikes and use those and then find a way to make sure that when anyone searches for those how-to videos that my vlogs about me dirt biking are recommended by tying my videos together. Do you get what I'm saying there? So you have to think of it in a channel context if you're gonna go with something like that versus the individual video because you're not gonna rank with dirt bike fails for the word dirt bike. But here's the thing, you could do a search and you could see if dirt bike fails is something that's being searched. And if it is, then you could look at that and then you could look at what sentences and phrases you could hack around to do that or what title in all the things that show up on a search result would be more interesting? Or can you capitalize the word fail? And is that more interesting visually than everything else? So does that make sense and does that help you out? All right, uh, someone else had a hand raised toward the back. Yes? The best surprise proposal ever. Ooh, um, okay. Very hard to make that search friendly. So I wouldn't try. I'd almost abandon making that search friendly. Um, Best, the phrase she went with was best surprise proposal ever. You're almost giving it away when you do that. If it was a vlog, even if it went the opposite of something, like I would have to then tease that. So instead of search, I would go with something that will be likely shared, something that would have quote unquote viral potential. Because here's the thing, I sense that a lot of you are doing, let me ask this. Who here is doing a vlog channel? Who here is doing an entertainment channel? All right, it's very challenging for you to do things that fit the context of your material and rank in search. 
it's not impossible. So you guys disproportionately are relying on your thumbnails. And so instead of search, what you have to then do is make share friendly titles, which is not the title of this uh, talk, but I'm gonna pivot and give you guys the value because that's what the audience is, because that's what you should do in YouTube is if what you're doing is not gonna fit the audience or it's not gonna fit the objective, then it's not gonna work. So let me pivot from search and I would still take notes on this, but if you're doing vlogs or entertainment, here's the thing. It's almost impossible, and you might have experienced, for this to rank in search for those videos. My answer to you is from a content strategy is make 70% or 80% of your content the thing that you're planning to do, but have 20% of your content be search friendly and evergreen so that you have something that's a funnel so that when people don't connect with what you're doing on an emotional level, there's something on an intellectual and practical psychology level that could get you new viewership because otherwise you're only making content for your existing audience and hoping to God that they share it in Facebook or Twitter so that more people find it. Does that make sense? So here's what I would do for those of you who are doing vlogs. So, all right, dirt bike fails. Like I said, I would put the words fails in all caps and I would also do research and search in TubeBuddy and see what else is ranking for that, what's competing for that. Uh, best surprise proposal, I would flip it. I would, even if it's technically somewhat of a fake out, here's what my strategy for that video would be. I would uh, make the title, he said yes, dot, 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 exclamation point or something like that, something like that. I'd probably even consider figuring out if I can put emojis at the end of that title then I would check that against the mobile to see if YouTube didn't screw up the emojis in the mobile or the desktop version of that. Then I'd have a really good thumbnail and I would have you being the one on bended knee opening the box because then that's click worthy. It's not click bait because as long as there's something in the video after they click that's emotionally satisfying, they don't feel like they were cheated. Does that make sense? So that's strategic. That's how you do something strategic. If you can't win on search, then you have to go completely on emotional. Search is partly intellectual in the fact that you're trying to satisfy a need or a desire based on the intention someone had, like how to grow a YouTube channel, how to get your first 100 subscribers, how to get 1,000 followers in Instagram, how to make money online, um, how to do public speaking, how to tie your shoes. If I was a family vlogger, I literally would have these adorable thumbnails with my kids and literally I would be doing how-to videos that's me teaching them a life lesson. I would literally just reverse engineer um, Mr. Rogers and things like that. I would literally just take little things, teaching your, your son how to tie a tie, blah, blah, blah. I would literally do how-to content of a family vlog by using it in the teaching life lessons kind of thing and I would still do other titles that then are super emotionally satisfying so that I win both sides every single time, but then I would just make sure that I have the best thumbnails on the search result page of all time, of all time. And that might mean that it's an adorable video. If I'm doing another, here's another hack on the thumbnail. On the thumbnail for the uh, surprise wedding proposal, couples kissing. Couples kissing as far as thumbnails will get clicked. Literally, you could like go through any of the romance videos on like uh, Jake Paul's channel and you definitely will see stuff like that. I'll just skip ahead in the presentation a little bit, but like, let's look at, you wanna talk about emotionally satisfying thumbnails or thumbnails that drive curiosity, which is a lot of my big thesis here. Almost nobody's doing it better than uh, Jake Paul, and I know a lot of people are on the Jake Paul train, but it's like the kid's smarter than most people realize. Everyone's underestimating it, because I analyzed his channel, and I realized that like eight months ago, his thumbnails sucked. That's just real, like eight months ago, he wasn't doing this. What he was doing was he was experimenting and eventually he found a thumbnail strategy that absolutely worked and was guaranteeing him a certain amount of views and then he improved on that thumbnail strategy and then made it the style that he does nearly all of his thumbnails in. And you can see that even if the thumbnails don't look exactly the same, you can see a very distinct and consistent style. Can you not? And then in terms of curiosity, and you look at the titles, these are emotional triggers that are happening. This is not something that is like, you know, necessarily stimulating an intellectual discussion of any kind or solving a problem for you, but it is something enough that if you have, you know, a couple of minutes to kill, you might click on it just out of morbid curiosity if nothing else. And so there is a strategy for that. 
If you look at Casey Neistat in terms of what I refer to as hero content, someone doing a handstand at the top of a mountain peak, you know what? That's worth a click. Seeing the words Kilimanjaro, it's like, gee, I've heard of that mountain before. I think that mountain devours people for breakfast. I might click on that. That might be worth a click. Oh, controversy. I see his face halfway in frame and I see uh, the CNN logo scribbled there. I might click on that just to go ramp it in the comment section. Okay, so there is um, you know, something to this in terms of thumbnails. If we go back to some of the consistency in like uh, my top performing video thumbnails, that comes back to you know, design aesthetic. And then that comes down to search friendly uh, things. You can notice that my top performing videos are things that either have top five list, top 10 list, um, how to, what is, the word tutorial, or a software application. But you'll notice that it's a combination of photography and design that works and that with me, it's either usually that the design or the photography is there or that there's something with the, the thumbnail to where it's at least expressing or conveying something. Top mistakes young and new YouTubers make, for example, it's like, it's a thumbnail that says it's like, ah, it conveys frustration. That's an emotion, you know, and that all matters. When you look at the things that Jake Paul is doing here, almost every time you see the faces in this, there's some kind of strong and powerful emotion conveyed. And we respond to that and we click on that. So faces are an advantage, but if you can't go with faces, it has to be a really good aesthetic design in terms of typography and colors or vector artwork, or it has to be stunning photography. Um, and you guys see that with vloggers all the time, that if nothing else, it's good photography for the thumbnails, right? If nothing else. So aesthetic matters. Just ask anybody here. I see all the MacBooks here. I think we all have really kind of figured out that, you know, gee, aesthetic wins people over. Sometimes, even if it's not literally the best thing, aesthetic wins. But let's look at something we saw in all these examples between you know, three different types of YouTube channels. One that does help content, one that does hub, community, oh, what my fan base wants kind of content, and then big hero well-produced content. Creativity, consistency, and context. Creativity, consistency, and context. If there is a secret formula to success in social media or in business, it's these three C's, creativity, consistency, and context. Creativity is what makes your thing unique. It's your style, it's your aesthetic, it's your performance, it's your talent, it's your skill set. It's whatever makes you, you, that is the creativity part and that leads. But you can reverse the order of these whenever you need because sometimes one has priority over the other. Consistency, if you figure out how to do something well, keep doing it. That's Jake Paul's secret, that's Casey Neistat's secret. Figure out how to do something that performs and does exactly what I want it to do, and then do that over and over and over, but do it creatively, do it slightly differently. And then context. In communicating something, in presenting something, context matters. We talked for a long time about the context of the thumbnails on a search page and like what mine did to stand out and mine uh, were different, and the subtle things that made you understand what was on the other side of that click and could compel you. Context sometimes isn't always intellectual. Sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes it's a big smiling face. Sometimes it's you know, looking like you're horrified. <gasps> you know, it's something. Sometimes it is that emotional quality. Context-wise, um, you know, seeing a video that is a family vlogger and seeing a family literally together that has an emotional trigger, a psychological trigger, but it's also clarity. That context is communicating a message to you. It's communicating what the value of this content is, but also what the values of the people that are participating in it are. Family, togetherness, you know, all those things. So you want those things to be clear. Context is about clarity of communication. So if you have something creative, but it's not clear or it was misleading, well, that's what we call clickbait. You had something, oh, this looks cool, but then you got rickrolled? That's not emotionally satisfying. You feel cheated. It's like, I was promised this and I got something else. That doesn't feel right. That feels unfair. Consistency, oh, you did this great zany viral video. Wow, the rest of your videos are subpar. Oh, wow, you had such great production values. Wow, today they kind of suck. It's like, wow, you put so much effort into this thing, but wow, came down here and it's like night and day, what happened? So consistency ultimately matters. So again, I brought up those three things. Uh, I did have all my contact information here for anyone who wants to reach out. We do have some time left 
and that means my favorite part, Q and A. So let's go ahead and let's get in just a little bit. How, or, or am I out of time? Or what? I'm out of time. So we're going to skip Q and A formally, and what I will do is I'm going to hang around in the hall for 30 minutes and answer any questions that any of you have because I've uh, a lot of. We can go to room F. Even better. So, okay, we're going to go to room F, and I'm going to answer all the questions that you guys might have. So, thank you for joining me for the main part of the presentation.